And we're starting off the list with the Lost Mickey Mouse cartoon. According to the story, Leonard Malton, a renowned film critic and historian, was reviewing old cartoons for the Disney Treasures Collection DVD. During this process, he and some colleagues stumbled upon a particularly disturbing and surreal Mickey Mouse short film with a title I can't really say on here, but it didn't sound like a title Walt would have okayed. The cartoon began with Mickey Mouse walking down a continuous street, a monotonous and repetitive backdrop accompanied by an unsettling dissonant soundtrack. As the cartoon progressed, Mickey's expression supposedly became increasingly distressed and disturbed. The animation styles described as crude and distorted. There's no coherent plot with Mickey aimlessly walking, occasionally encountering unsettling and surreal imagery before it completely cut to black. When the cartoon came back, things got even worse. Mickey was walking down the same street on repeat, but now there was no music, just an indistinguishable murmuring in the background. Then Mickey's face began to melt as the world around him became more and more distorted. Some versions of the story claim that the original viewers were so deeply disturbed by the animation that a few of them even experienced psychological distress. If you are enjoying our channel, so far, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We have awesome videos coming at you on the daily, so don't miss out. All right, number nine, we have Dr. Claw's True Identity. Any Inspector Gadget fans in the audience, I always forget about this show uh, a bit before my time, I guess. That theme song, though, I'll be on my deathbed, unable to recognize my own grandkids, but uh, you know, sing that tune, and I'll be like, Go, Gadget, go! Anyway, Dr. Claw is the big villain of this series, but we never see who Dr. Claw actually is. Just his metal arm stroking his devilish cat as he exclaims, I'll get you next time, Gadget. So, the question is, what does Dr. Claw actually look like? Well, this theory goes that Dr. Claw is actually the real Inspector Gadget. He uh, yeah, had died from a terrible accident that destroyed most of his body. Gadget's niece, Penny, distraught with grief, then built the Inspector Gadget we see in the show, a replica of sorts. So, this vengeful spirit now seeks to destroy his imposter. It's a fun idea. If Inspector Gadget was uh, darker and aimed at an older audience, this would have been a cool direction to take the show in. A uh, nice final season and twist, perhaps. At our number eight spot, we have the lost SpongeBob Squidward episode. So the story goes that a former Nickelodeon intern claimed to have stumbled upon a mysterious and disturbing episode of SpongeBob. The episode supposedly starts with Squidward preparing for a clarinet concert, but the atmosphere is just unusually tense, and Squidward appears visibly distressed. As the episode progresses, the tone becomes increasingly sinister. Squidward's concert ends up going horribly wrong, leading to a loud, high-pitched sound, and then we cut back to Squidward, who is shown sitting on the edge of his bed, crying softly. The animation becomes hyper-realistic. I guess how it is whenever it does uh, those close-up gnarly paintings uh, in Spongebob. Squidward's eyes are bloodshot, and his sobs just get louder and more anguished. Then the scene continues for several minutes before Squidward takes his own life. Apparently, this lost episode was so disturbing that the original animators and crew members were traumatized after watching it. Some versions go that the intern who discovered the episode was then fired and the episode itself was destroyed to prevent it from ever being aired. At number seven, we have the Parasect is a Zombie Theory. Now, this is a Pokemon fan theory. There's gonna be some of you out there like, oh, don't call anime cartoons. I know Pokemon is an anime. It's insulting to use the word cartoon. It's animation from Japan, all right? Anyway. Let's talk about the Pokemon Parasect and its previous form, Paris. These Pokemon have little mushrooms attached to their back, Tochukasu mushrooms, which are parasitic. They draw on the nutrients in the Pokemon's body, but Paris is not fully under the control of the mushrooms, but some of their actions are partially influenced by them. But as these mushrooms continue to grow, Paris evolves into Parasect. At this point, the mushroom on its back is far larger, it basically takes up the whole body, and now it has full control over the creature and Parasect only has the whites of its eyes exposed, almost like it's dead and doesn't even need to see as its actions are completely controlled 
by the large mushroom on its back. And it's also said that removing the mushroom from a parasect's back will stop it from moving altogether. Maybe what that really means is that parasect has no life left in it anymore, simply being a vessel for its mushroom to control. This is based on a real life parasitic fungus called cordyceps, which invade the bodies of different insects and basically turn them into mindless zombies in real life. And the cordyceps will actually grow out of their host's bodies too, much like what you have here. So this one, not too far fetched, probably is exactly what they were intending. Next on the list, we have Dead Bart. The Lost Simpsons episode entitled Dead Bart is a creepypasta, an internet horror story that revolves around an alleged lost episode of The Simpsons. According to the story, an anonymous writer claims to be a former writer for the show who worked on an episode titled Dead Bart, which was never aired. In this creepy tale, the lost episode begins with the familiar Simpsons family sitting on the couch, but everything appears slightly off. The colors are muted, the animation quality is poorer than usual. The family also seems to have genuine disdain for each other, not the type of lighthearted, jokey bickering you typically see in the show. The atmosphere is just eerie. The Simpsons get on a plane and Bart, having uh, messed around like Bart does, accidentally breaks a window and gets sucked out before falling to his death. The art is described as looking far too realistic to be anything other than disturbing. We cut to the rest of the family, sitting at the dinner table sobbing. The scene goes on longer than it should, and there's no humor to the crying. It's not exaggerated enough to be funny. It's just sad. We cut to one year later, and Marge, Homer, and Lisa are skeletally thin now, sitting at the dinner table once again. Maggie, nowhere to be seen. They decide to visit Bart's grave, but when they get there, Bart's body is just laying right in front of his gravestone in a state of decomposition, drawn in that same realistic art style as before. At this point, Homer makes a joke, but it isn't entirely clear what the joke is. Then it fades to black as the episode comes to an end. No music, just crudely drawn credits. Next up, we have another Pokemon conspiracy theory, the Cubone's mother theory. So it's pretty well known that Cubone wears the skull of its deceased mother, which is already pretty dark. You'd think its mother is Marowak though, right? But maybe not. For a long time, fans have speculated that maybe Cubone is the orphan child of Kangaskhan. The two Pokemon, they do look pretty similar. Same color scheme, they both have three fingers with claws in the shape of Kangaskhan's head. Kind of similar to the skull uh, Cubone wears. So the idea is that Cubone would evolve into Marowak. Marowak would evolve into its third evolution, Kangaskhan, and then the cycle would repeat. Now this does help explain why Cubone doesn't have an official third evolution. Not that every Pokemon does, but that some don't even evolve at all. But, but anyway, I could see this one making sense. Next up, we have Ed, Ed, and Eddie's purgatory theory. This is a pretty popular one, also very dark. The idea here is that the characters are actually in purgatory, a place between heaven and hell where the souls are cleansed of their sins before moving on to the afterlife. I guess the main crux of this theory is that the characters don't leave their suburban cul-de-sac. No matter how much they try, they are always stuck in the same place, kind of like purgatory where souls are trapped until they are purified of their sins. The show's setting is also a bit ambiguous. There aren't any adults around and the neighborhood it seems frozen in this perpetual summer. There's also theories written about each character and their past and like how they died and stuff, but that's there's not really any evidence in the show to support that stuff. It's more just pure fiction, but anyway, interesting uh, theory. And number three, we have another Simpsons one. This one is uh, more general. The Simpsons knack for predicting the future. There have been so many instances of this that, that some people believe it just can't be a coincidence. One of the most famous instances is the episode Bart to the Future. The episode where Bart uh, glimpses into the future and finds that his sister Lisa has become the president of the United States, succeeding a fictional present Donald Trump. And of course, in 2017, Donald Trump was actually inaugurated as the 45th president of the United States. Another crazy prediction came in Homer Votes 2012, where a voting machine malfunctions, changing Homer's vote from Barack Obama to Mitt Romney. In the 2012 presidential elections, similar issues with voting machines were uh, reported, although not involving characters from The Simpsons. The show has also been credited with predicting various technological advancements and like society 
societal changes. They showcased smartwatches in 1995, long before they became a big mainstream gadget. The advent of autocorrect on phones was also humorously shown in a 1994 episode. The list goes on. We could do an entire list of Simpsons predictions alone, and oh wait, we actually have. All right, one last Pokemon theory for you. There, there's so many, I couldn't help myself. This one concerns Mimikyu. Uh, yeah, these unsettling looking creepy Pokemon and Pikachu costumes. There's always been the mystery as to what Mimikyu really looks like under there, as its outward appearance is really just a disguise, a crudely slapped together Pikachu costume. So uh, yeah, what is going on under there? Well, this theory suggests that maybe Mimikyu is actually more closely related to Pikachu than we might think. It doesn't just want to look like Pikachu, it's not just dressing up as one, it's Pikachu's former form, Pichu, only uh, dead. Undead Pichus that never got a chance to evolve and now wear these haphazard disguises and these attempts to take on the form they wish they could have reached in life. Honestly, this one, not that far-fetched, especially when you look at their typing mimic you as a ghost fairy type. Kind of feel bad for these little things now. Another thing that ties into Pichu is they know some of the same moves, uh, like Thunderbolt. Pretty interesting. Finally though, number one, we have the SpongeBob nuclear testing theory. This fan theory suggests that Bikini Bottom might be based on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Bikini Atoll was the site of several hydrogen bomb tests conducted by the United States between 1946 and 58. So according to this theory, these nuclear tests caused these sea creatures in Bikini Bottom to become radioactive and granting them human level intelligence and abilities, explaining their ability to speak, attend school, hold down jobs. Uh, that and the fact that it's a cartoon, but forget about that for now. And an anonymous source claiming to be affiliated with the SpongeBob SquarePants production team once stated that some fan theories like this one are considered semi-canon among the writing staff. The theory gained further momentum when the interpretation of the episode where SpongeBob visits rock bottom, one of my favorite episodes. Some fans speculate that the dark nightmarish rock bottom could be the result of a giant crater left by one of the nuclear bombs. In our number nine spot today, we have Inspector Gadget. In the show, Inspector Inspector Gadget, we never see the evil Dr. Claw's face on screen. However, there's been a long standing urban legend that we did see him at one point. In this one mysterious episode, we got a glimpse of his face, and that was later used as the inspiration for the action figure of Dr. Claw, which now shows his face. The creators knew this was a huge deal at the time, and when you went to buy the action figure in stores, they covered up his face in the packaging, so you had to buy it back in the day to see what Mr. Claw looked like. These days, you can just Google it, and it'll be the first thing that pops up. His face is also briefly visible in the Inspector Gadget game for the Super Nintendo, but since the quality of the game was pretty bad, we never got a good look until the action figure. In our number 8 spot today, we have Dungeons & Dragons. In the 1980s Dungeons & Dragons cartoon show, there is a famous urban legend that the last episode of the show shared a crazy secret about the entire show that changes everything. The episode itself also reportedly never made it to TV, but some people claimed that it was accidentally aired once. This episode revealed that all of the characters were actually killed in a roller coaster accident and they ended up in the afterlife. The writer who made the real final episode has denied these claims numerous times and he even uploaded his script to prove it. In the ending, the kids deliberated after being offered a choice whether to go back to Earth or continue fighting in the D&D world. In our number 7 spot today, we have Gravity Falls. The story with the show Gravity Falls was that allegedly it was supposed to be three seasons but was cut down to only two seasons after Alex Hirsch decided he wanted to wrap up the show. Apparently, many fans think that there were a lot of unanswered questions that would have been answered in this rumored third season. The source of this idea comes from a Reddit AMA done after the season one finale, where a fan asked how many seasons he'd ideally like the show to last, with Hirsch's response being that he originally considered three seasons, but now believed that was too much. Hirsch would say many times over the years that the show was never planned to have three seasons, and blames the rumor on the fact that he was not allowed to announce that season 2 was the last season when he first learned so. In our number 6 spot today, we have Phidias and Ferb. Phidias and Ferb is one of those cartoons where there are so many strange theories, it's hard to know where to start. But the most insane one that I have ever heard of claims that Dr. Doofenshmirtz, the evil madman, is actually the father of Phineas. The main evidence is that Phineas and Doofenshmirtz both have the same shaped heads. Let's break this down. We know that Linda, 
Phineas's mom and Doof actually dated way back, so not hard to assume that they could have birthed a child. The story is that the couple dated when they were both really young and eventually split up. Both of them go on to get married to other people and have kids with them. That explains Candace's father. After a few years, Linda either splits from Candace's dad and has a fling with Doof, or she cheats with Doof. Either way, it results in the birth of Phineas. Then, years later, she meets Ferb's dad, they get married, and then they turn into one big family. In our number five spot today, we have Strawberry Shortcake. Okay, so basically, this isn't necessarily inherently terrifying, but it's kind of crazy to see the power of rumors and how, even while the truth is out there, some people will still believe falsities. Basically, this story has to do with Strawberry Shortcake and how there was some troll out there who claimed to be the niece of someone working for the entertainment company that makes the show. Basically, this person went on to spread a ton of rumors, mostly relating to season four, that includes a ton of false synopsis, and they even manipulated some audio and released it as proof. In the end, this of course was bound to cause trouble, so people began trying to clear the air, and of course, once the season was actually released, it was clear that this troll had just released a bunch of lies. In the end, however, despite all of the proof that these were false claims, there are many people out there who still choose to reject the truth and take these lies as reality. In our number four spot today, we have Mickey Mouse. So basically, this is a legend that starts out 100% true. Basically, it starts out saying that on September 1st, 1939, the BBC broadcast of the Mickey Mouse cartoon, Mickey's Gala Premiere, was abruptly interrupted and ceased due to the sudden outbreak of World War II. That's terrible, and it's absolutely terrifying. The legend goes on to claim that after the war ended and when broadcasts resumed, that the episode was picked up in the exact same moment as when it had previously been interrupted all those years ago. That certainly would have been slightly symbolic, but also exceptionally eerie, but it turns out that that is not true. While it is true that the cartoon was indeed the last pro program shown by the BBC before suspension, it aired in its entirety before the interruption in 1939, as well as after the interruption in 1946. It is believed that this legend came from a 1984 documentary which showed exactly what the legend described, but this was likely placed in the documentary for dramatic effect. In our number 3 spot today, we have Gravity Falls 2. For another Gravity Falls urban legend, we have this one that circulated the internet. Basically, it comes in the form of a screenshot that shows Dipper and Mabel with a slender man standing there watching them from behind. Definitely creepy, but turns out that this is in fact not real. The actual episode shows no slender man and creator Alex Hirsch actually commented on this legend in an interview. He noted that one of the very first times he overheard someone talking about the show after its premiere was when he heard someone telling another person that the legend was true. Despite this rumor not being true at all, there is actually a slender man appearance in Gravity Falls media and it's a one panel cameo in the story titled Face It, which is in the graphic novel Gravity Falls Lost Legends. In our number two spot today, we have Hey Arnold. Hey Arnold is an absolutely classic cartoon, but this legend surrounding the episode titled Pigeon Man is quite dark. Basically, in this episode, there is a character who is called the Pigeon Man, and the legend suggests that in the original ending of this episode, he takes his own life after finding his home destroyed. The legend continues on to say that Nickelodeon forced the writers to change the ending because they were worried it was too dark, and if this were true, I would certainly be inclined to agree. In the end, however, this legend was in fact debunked by the show creator himself, Craig Bartlett. That was never the intended ending, and I mean, I think that's probably a good thing. In the actual ending of the show, the Pigeon Man flies away with the pigeons, and because of this dark rumor, people speculate that this was actually his death, but that is also likely untrue because of his subsequent appearances later on. In our number one spot today, we have King of the Hill. King of the Hill had one episode that was subject to the internet's weirdest and darkest rumors. The episode in question is called Pygmalion. The episode as a whole is wild and it's really dark and creepy, which is exactly why it isn't really a surprise that there is a dark legend surrounding it. Basically, in this episode, there's a character called Trip Larson who suffers from quite a few serious things and he also inherited the Larson's pork products plant from his father. Long story short, he does some messed up stuff and ends up meeting a gruesome fate in the end. Also spare you the gory details. So basically, according to urban legend, it says that after Tripp's death, while Peggy and Luann are talking and celebrating, you can see an incredibly graphic and dark image of Tripp's body behind them. There is simply no evidence that this ever happened, and it's likely just a really dark story that had its origins somewhere on the internet, but you really just wonder exactly where this sort of thing came from. Starting off this countdown, we have the shark cult. 
Baby Shark has a huge cult-like following. I mean, tons of babies and kids are obsessed with this song. Hey, even some adults. For some families, it's constantly on replay. Well, theory goes that the main objective behind this song was to raise a loyal following. As a result, they can easily control kids by this song, or different versions of it. They can use their powers for good or evil. Coming in at number nine, we have the violent versions. Now, there are so many knockoff versions of Baby Shark, mainly by other companies that just want a piece of the profit. But these versions seem to teach kids about violence and to become aggressive. So in one version, it shows very hungry sharks almost mulling a group of cute little fish. In a Japanese version of the song, it shows the sharks almost killing a family of penguins. Yeah, that's right. These cute little penguins, especially this cute little baby penguin, almost get killed by the shark family. It's a pretty dark and unexpected version that may just be teaching kids to be savage and violent like sharks. Moving on to number eight, we have the mind control. This next theory suggests that baby shark is so catchy because it contains a mind control element. It basically has the ability to control children and adults. When you watch baby shark, the bright colors and graphics draw your child in. Their eyes hardly leave the screen. They follow along to the actions mindlessly, all effects of mind control. So if the video suddenly said, kill your family, do, 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 the kids would do as the video says and commit the deed. Moving on to number seven, we have the real version. Believe it or not, but the song Baby Shark actually dates back to the 90s or even before then. It was originally a song sung at camp. However, this version was much darker. In the 2012 version of Baby Shark, it has the normal four sharks, but also a human swimmer. In the song, the swimmer gets attacked by the sharks. You then sing, lost an arm, do, 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 and then lost a leg, do, 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 and then they perform CPR, do, 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 but it's not working, do, 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 and so then they go to heaven, and it's just super dark. But that's not all. In the 90s version, apparently the swimmer loses a leg, then loses another leg, loses their head, then goes to heaven where they're reincarnated by Jesus. So your kids may be singing a friendly version of it now, but the song originated from a very dark one. Coming in at number six, we have the dead shark. So in the song, we get introduced to baby shark, mommy and daddy shark, and grandma and grandpa shark. Then the song takes a dark twist and they go hunting, and then the poor fish swim away until they're safe at last, do do. But then the song finishes with it's the end. Well, people believe that this actually refers to that it's the end of the character Baby Shark, that he actually died. Unable to capture food, Baby Shark being a little baby grew frail and passed away. So kids are literally dancing and singing about a poor Baby Shark that ends up dying. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the experiment. So this next theory goes in hand with the real origins of the song and how it was once about a human being killed in a vicious shark attack. Well, theory goes that the creators of Baby Shark wanted to see if they could turn a violent song into a popular, catchy kid song. They did this to prove how easily kids can be influenced. In fact, the creation of the song was meant to reveal how easy it is to infiltrate and influence young minds. They literally took a violent song, changed the lyrics up a bit, and geared it towards children to prove this. Making our way down the list in number four, we have the back masking. So back masking is a technique that basically hides messages in songs. This message can only be revealed when the song is played backwards. Well, Baby Shark has a very creepy message in the song when it's played backwards. So I listened to it backwards and it sounds like it says, crush the dead, and then voodoo doo 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 doo, like voodoo. Then at other points in the song, it says, yeah, use this voodoo, doo 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 doo. Then grandpa's shark backwards sounds like crush your dad. Now, I don't know what this means, but the crush the dead lyrics and everything about the voodoo is just super creepy. So subconsciously, these messages are getting pumped into your children's heads. Who knows what it's really doing to them. In our third spot, we have the stereotypes. Now let's really take a closer look at this video. It is filled with gender stereotypes. First of all, the girl sings and dances to the female characters. She sings about mommy shark and grandma shark. 
On top of that, she's wearing a pink shirt. Then the boy is wearing a blue shirt and sings and dances to the male characters, Daddy and Grandpa Shark. But that's not all. Look at the hand movements. Both the male characters have bigger hand movements. Why? Because in society, it's thought that men are bigger and stronger and more dominant than females. So females are the little tiny soft ones. So theory goes that this whole video is enforcing gender roles on children so that the kids grow up accordingly and follow this social construct. In our second slot, we have the subliminal messages. Okay, this theory is quite nuts but it's basically that Baby Shark is actually a song about the devil. So if you look at the song, obviously it goes like Baby Shark, everyone knows how it goes, but they say do, 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 whatever. They say that six times. Then the line Baby Shark is repeated three times, meaning that if we add it up, it equals six, six, six the devil's number. It's thought that this number invokes Satan. On top of that, apparently do is a short form of demons or diumos or diamo. Well, diamos, otherwise known as diamo, is a devil. She has four horns on her head, four hooked teeth in her mouth, and her feet are like roosters. Therefore, people think that this song is literally a chant to summon demons or the devil. And in our number one spot, we have the catchy tune. So why is it that Baby Shark is so catchy? Don't lie to yourself, there's been a point where the song has gotten stuck in your head. In fact, it may be stuck in your head at this very moment. The mere mention of the name Baby Shark gets the tune stuck in your head. So what causes this? Well, some say it's because of the simple lyrics and hand actions and the very repetitive tune. But on a more darker note, other people think it's because of some underlying tune that we can't hear. This tune is so high pitched that it's inaudible, but these high pitched frequencies penetrate our brain and our eardrums, making it resonate in our head for hours. Additionally, there are videos of kids crying and then as soon as the song comes on, they're all happy and shaken and grooving. Why is this? Well, the high pitch frequency releases endorphins, which fill us with a pleasant sensation. This is why it can make kids extremely happy and addicted to the song. Starting off this countdown, we have the names. Okay, seriously, what is up with the Berenstain Bears names? We have Mama and Papa Bear and Sister and Brother Bear. Yet other people around them have real names like Lizzie Bruin and Bertha Broom. So why don't these characters have names? Like, were their parents always Mama and Papa Bear, even before having kids and being parents? I know that Brother Bear was named Little Bear, and then when his sister was born, he was named Brother Bear. Like, what the heck? So theory goes that the Berenstain Bears don't have names because their parents are fugitives on the run. They don't want anyone knowing who they really are so they use fake names. Once their cover is blown, they move to a different city and change their names again. Hence why Little Bear is now Brother Bear. The parents are really lacking creativity at this point. And apparently Mama and Papa Bear used to be called Missy and Junior. Why give up those names for Mama and Papa Bear? Well, because they are criminals and they can never reveal their true identity. Well, too bad, I'm on to you. In our ninth spot, we have Stranger Danger. There's one book in particular that teaches children about the dangers of a stranger. This book was titled Learn About Strangers. Basically, it starts off with Sister Bear happily greeting everyone she sees. Then her family warns her to never talk to strangers. Papa Bear even scares her by showing news headlines about what happened to those that talk to strangers. The headlines read, Stranger Kidnaps Cub and Missing Cub Found. Well, theory goes that that cub that went missing was Papa Bear himself. Yep, he had a traumatic past where he got abducted when he was little. Thankfully, he was found. But still, that's a pretty scary thing to happen. In our eighth spot, we have the lost book. Story goes that one day a woman was scrolling through the Google shopping function when she came across an old Berenstain Bears book. It was one that she never read before as a kid, so she decided to buy it and read it. Well, it turns out that that book was very disturbing. 
Apparently, the book was filled with disturbing images of the bears and of creepy humans dressed up as the bears. Then wacky things would happen to them, like Mama and Sister Bear would get covered in maggots and then they started vomiting on each other. I don't know what happened to this book, but that'll teach you to never use the Google Shopping option again. In our seventh spot, we have the Mandela Effect. So, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, some people, like me, Clearly remember it being Bernstein Bears, spelled S-T-E-I-N. But nope, I've been living a life of lies and deceit because apparently it is and has always been the Bernstein Bears, S-T-A-I-N. But I'm not the only one. Thousands of others remember it being the Bernstein Bears. This is a prime example of the Mandela Effect. The Mandela Effect, for those of you who don't know, is named off of Nelson Mandela because people clearly remember him dying in prison in the 80s when he didn't actually pass away until 2013. So theory goes that there are parallel universes out there. In this case, we have the Steen universe and the Stain universe. We lived in the Steen universe until the 90s when the books were out. But then later on, we somehow shifted into the Stain universe. Somehow that universe ended up overlapping with ours, which is why we have the memory of the Steen books. They were real just in the other universe. In our sixth spot, we have the glitch in the matrix. So this again has to do with the name switch. Just know you're not crazy. I'm 99% sure it was Berenstein Bears, but whatever. So theory goes that there was a glitch in our world, one that changed the name from Berenstein Bears to Berenstein Bears. What else can account for the thousands of people out there that also remember the S-T-E-I-N spelling? There was even a photo going around of someone who had two of the exact copies of the Berenstain Bears VHS tape. One was spelled the proper way, Berenstain, and one was spelled the imposter way, Berenstain. So there, we witness a real life glitch. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the snacks. So let's jump back over to the bears' names again. It seems like they are named after who they are. Mama Bear is a mother. Papa Bear is a father, and Brother Bear is a brother to his sister, Sister Bear. But there's one bear in the Berenstain Bears family that doesn't follow this pattern, and that's the youngest bear, Honey Bear. Why on earth isn't her name like Littlest Bear or Little Girl Bear or something like that? Well, her name is Honey, and what do bears eat? Honey, aka Honey Bear is going to end up being the Berenstain Bears little snack, yikes. Making our way down the list at number four, we have the butterfly effect. I'm not letting go of this name controversy, I don't care. Here's another theory as to what happened. So at some point between the years 1986 and 2011, someone traveled back in time and altered the timeline of human history. While they were doing this, the name got switched to Berenstain. Don't be fooled though, the time traveler didn't just go back in time to change the name of the series and mess with us. No, they went back to do something else and then ended up changing the name, whether it be accidental or on purpose. We may never know. But it happened. That's why other things in life have changed ever so slightly. Like Mona Lisa's smile. Some say that she used to have a more obvious smile. Or the color chartreuse. It's a shade of green, but some people remember it being a magenta pink color. Coming in at number three, we have the alien world. This theory goes that the Berenstain Bears exist in the same world as aliens. Yeah, you heard me correctly. But the bears are actually the dominant species. So in the episode titled The Big Blooper, there is a scene where Lizzie and Sister Bear are playing together with some dolls. The thing is, the dolls look exactly like humans, meaning that the bears are aware of people, meaning they exist at the same time together. However, these human dolls have weird blue and green skin making them look a lot like aliens, meaning they are alien-human hybrids. So just like how we have toys of stuffed bears, the bears now have toys of us. Except in this case, we have mutated to become half alien. Yikes, maybe the show takes place in the future where aliens and humans intermingle. In our second spot, we have the lost episode. Theory goes that there is a very spooky lost episode out there that was the real reason as to why the show got canceled. This episode was never supposed to be broadcasted on TV, but it accidentally did and disturbed the viewers. 
After that, the show got taken off air completely. So according to the narrator, he was at an old pawn shop one day when he found that very episode. Up until that point, it was deemed a lost episode. The episode was titled, The Death of Brother and Sister. And well, I bet you can guess what it was about. Basically, in the episode, both the siblings end up jumping out of a plane and falling to death. The parents were so devastated that they ended up taking their lives. Yeah, not a very child friendly episode. And in our number one spot, we have the theme song. The Berenstain Bears theme song is pretty catchy, but if you really listen to the lyrics, you'll find out that something is very, very wrong with these bears. So the opening song's lyrics goes as follows. Somewhere deep in bear country lies the Berenstein bear family. They're kind of furry around the torso. They're a lot like people, only more so. I'm sorry, what? They're a lot like people, only more so? How on earth are bears more human than humans? Then it continues on saying, they're just like you and me. The only difference is they live in a tree. So now theory goes that the characters in the Berenstein Bears are an evolved species of humans. That's the only way they can be more human than humans. It's because the show is set at a point in time where humans have evolved to their elite form, which apparently is a bear. Yeah, I don't think Darwin included that in his theories. Coming in at number 10, we have Lincoln is actually a genius. If Lincoln was indeed a genius, why would he be hiding it? What nefarious things could this kid be doing behind the scenes? Well, first, let me explain to you why we think Lincoln could be the smartest one on the show. In the episode, The Butterfly Effect, Lincoln imagines a chain of horrible events that happen because of an accident that he causes, which he is too scared to tell the other family members. In this imaginary trail, we have Lenny solve Lisa's unsolvable math equation, which seems impossible if you know the characters at all. Well, this was all taking place in Lincoln's head, so this would mean that Lincoln would have known the answer to the equation and had been hiding his brilliance this whole time. But the real question is why? Why has Lincoln not been telling any of the other family members that he has the biggest brain in the house? What does he have planned for them? Which actually rolls into my next point. Coming in at number nine, we have what else is Lincoln hiding? If we use the episode The Butterfly Effect as another springboard for conspiracy theories, the episode is all about Lincoln making a mistake and not wanting to tell his family and imagining all the horrible outcomes that happened from his screw up. This shows that Lincoln has a tendency to overthink about the potential outcome from his actions and probably has screwed up before and has found ways to hide it from the whole family. This has led fans to speculate on what other secrets he could be hiding from the house. There could be a ton of accidents that he has caused but managed to sweep under the rug. And when you're living in a house with that many siblings, it might make it easier to get away with everything. So now he could have hidden so many things that it becomes second nature to lie and do it over and over again. Coming in at number eight, we have Lincoln is the favorite. If this is true, then that is definitely rude. You can't pick a favorite kid. You're going to give all your other kids an inferiority complex. But there is some good evidence to back this one up. First, being that Lincoln is the only boy, and many fans speculate that the reason the Loud family is so big is because they kept trying to have a boy. Eventually, the parents got what they wished for, and he became their prized child. They loved him more than the the rest because they clearly had gender preferences. And the second part being that Lincoln is included in all the activities that the siblings do. Now this is obviously because he is the main character, but that is not a fun theory at all. Other people have theorized that he is the center of attention for two reasons. Either his parents love him the most and they force his siblings to take him everywhere fun because they want Lincoln to experience everything. Or all the siblings know that he's the favorite, so they include him in everything so they can be in good favor with their parents. Either way, this is pretty messed up. Coming in at number seven, we have the loud parents don't love Lincoln. Okay, let's flip the last theory on its head. What if it's the exact opposite of what I just said? That is what is awesome about doing a theories video. You can come at it from any angle you want. Some fans think that Lincoln was the boy that the loud parents always wanted, and they were going to stop having kids after they got him. But as Lincoln started to grow up, they saw that he didn't have the potential that the other kids do, so they kept trying for another boy. Obviously, they didn't get their wish, and now they look down on the would-be golden child as a disappointment, and and they have never given him the love that he deserves. This could also be why Lincoln has the smallest room in the house. Coming in at number six, we have Lisa and Lenny are autistic. Well, let's do a quick breakdown of the two characters. We have Lisa, who is the super genius, by far the smartest member of the Loud House, but she sometimes can't find a way to connect with people on a human level. It seems that she understands math equations better than she understands human emotion, and she puts more value on work than her interpersonal relationships, which 
which is fine, but also a sign of being autistic or having Asperger's disease. And Lenny, while it seems like she is the ditzy blonde character of the family, it would seem that the smallest concepts confuse her. Turning off the lights make her think that she's gone blind, and small obstacles hold her back. Both of them seem unable to pick up on things that most people would consider regular or extremely easy, which could be a sign of being autistic. Coming in at number five, we have why is Lincoln's hair white? I know we covered a reason why his hair is white in the first video, but there are so many theories as to why this dude has an interesting hair color, so I'm bringing you a brand new theory. Apparently, there are a bunch of people that think Lincoln could be actually very old, and that is why his hair is that color. But why does he look so young? Well, the theory is that he's actually a time traveler, and through his technology, they're able to make him look young, but they haven't quite figured out the hair yet. But he traveled back in time and took the original Lincoln spot for some reason. Who knows why someone would want to come back in time and live in a house with 11 brothers and sisters wouldn't be my first choice, that's for sure. Coming in at number four, we have Lucy is Immortal. It seems that throughout the show, Lucy shows more and more potential to have supernatural powers. She can appear out of nowhere. She can summon animals like bats, and it seems like she can communicate with the great beyond. Well, in one episode, we see Lucy looking at a picture of her great-great-grandmother, and guess what? They look like they could be twins. Some say that this could just be strong genes, while others think that this is actually Lucy, that she has found a way to live forever through witchcraft and work her way into the Loud family by threatening the parents with black magic. That is why she is the next child after the boy. The Loud family was going to stop having kids after the boy, but then she came in and then they had to keep having kids to cover up this weird mystery goth kid that just showed up. Coming in at number three, we have one more theory on Lincoln's hair. I told you there was quite a bit going on when it came to this kid's white hair. Well, apparently there is another theory that is much more sad. Some fans have theorized that he actually is suffering from pageria, which is a horrible disease which causes a person's body to age rapidly. So someone who's only 10 or 12 will look like they are 70. Now, of course, Lincoln doesn't look like he's in his 70s, but people think he could just have a milder version of the illness, which means he could live for longer, but he would still have a shorter life expectancy. I told you that this was a sad theory. Coming in at number two, we have bad parents. Okay, you have 11 kids. That is a massive responsibility. I think if I had to take care of one, I would lose it in about three hours. They're always on the move, and I love taking a nap, so it wouldn't be hard for the little rascal to escape from me. But if we watch episode after episode of The Loud House, we will see that the loud parents aren't really around. They take off constantly and they leave a house full of kids to take care of their own problems. That is absolutely bonkers, mainly because one of the kids is an 11 month old baby. Yeah, I clearly don't know a lot about babies or how to take care of them, but I really think that a kid who can't feed itself, clean itself, or survive on its own should be left behind to fend for itself. And then you have all of the other kids messing around with expensive instruments, using chemistry sets, and possibly practicing black magic. I would have to say that if child services walked through the door, they would be quick to call someone to start moving these kids into new homes. And coming in at the number one spot, we have Lori or Lenny gave birth to Lily. Oh, now we're getting into some real spicy gossip. These are the theories that keep you guys coming back again and again. So let's give this one a little bit of a backbone. Lily is, of course, the youngest member of the Loud family at only 11 months old. Lori and Lenny are the two oldest sisters in the Loud family. Some fans think that it's a little strange that the Loud parents would crank out another kid when they had everything rounded out at a perfect 10. But also, this isn't that crazy of a happening. There are countless stories of young teen moms having kids, but they are too young to take on that much responsibility. There is also the social taboo of having a kid so young or outside of marriage. So the parents step in and claim the kid as their own to help everyone out. This same thing actually happened to Jack Nicholson. He grew up thinking that his mom was his sister. That is wild. Coming in at number nine, we have Mentally Unstable. Throughout the show, there are moments where the main characters will act a little strange. And by a little strange, I mean they will have full mental breakdowns. Now, usually this is just used as a form of humor. Everyone laughs and goes on with their business, ignoring what had just happened. Now, this could be because this is just how ponies are meant to act, but a lot of people who watch the show think that the characters from the series are showcasing signs of manic depressive disorder. Usually everyone just ignores what's going on, which probably will only make matters worse. It's only a matter of time before one of these ponies has a breakdown that seriously hurts someone. Coming in at number eight, we have Slender Pony. Whoever it was that came up with Slenderman, I gotta say, 
Bravo. You have made a modern day horror character that has stood the test of time. Future generations will look back on this character on par with Freddy, Jason, and many of the other creepy beasts from classic entertainment. And now Slenderman has even worked its way into My Little Pony. In a certain episode of My Little Pony, some fans saw something a little strange floating around in the background. They saw a pony that was wearing a suit and hiding in the bushes. The internet quickly came together to say that Slenderman now exists in the MLP universe. Some other people say that this was just another pony in a suit, and there's no way that Slenderman, or should I say Slender Pony, could ever exist. But I'm gonna stick with the idea that this monster is real because it's way more fun. Coming in at number seven, we have the fight for freedom. If we go back through the My Little Pony history, we will find that the toys used to have bridles. If you don't know what a bridle is, it's sort of a muzzle that you can put on a horse to help you control it when you ride it, which sounds good for a regular horse. Although I think it's not cruel. Is that cruel? I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you're not supposed to use bridles. I don't know. But back to my point, the ponies from MLP are just as intelligent as humans. So the presence of bridles in the universe would mean that at one time people were forcefully controlling the ponies, which has made some people speculate that the ponies used to be enslaved and had to fight for their freedom. Honestly, I think My Little Revolution Ponies has a nice ring to it. Coming in at number six, we have the Psych Ward. If we are right about the ponies going crazy, then maybe there's a place where they take all these crazy ponies. There is evidence of this in one episode. It's called Read It and Weep. There's a part where Dr. Stables is talking to Rainbow Dash and you can hear a dog barking. This is very strange. I wasn't aware there were dogs in the My Little Pony universe. Well, it turns out that this wasn't a dog at all. This was another pony who looks deranged and is barking like an animal. Now, this might have just been one of the ponies making a joke, but then we see that she's wearing a hospital gown, which makes me think that she just broke out of the loony bin. This means that there could be a dark side to the My Little Pony world. Maybe there's an Arkham Asylum style place with all the most dangerous ponies locked away. Maybe there's a Joker pony that we have never heard about. Coming in at number five, we have Fluttershy will turn them all. For those of you who keep up with all the changes that have happened throughout the My Little Pony animated series, you will know that in one episode, Bats, Fluttershy gets turned into what is basically a vampire. Now the show makes this pretty much the cutest vampire of all time by making Fluttershy part vampire bat, so she gets an uncontrollable urge to eat fruit. But some fans think it's only a matter of time before she gets the craving for blood and she will slowly but surely turn all the other ponies into vampires just like her. This is backed up by the vampire tooth that's spotted in her mouth at the end of the episode. Coming in at number four, we have Pony Gen Gentrification. The world that the ponies live in is not all gumdrops and rainbows. There's a lot of it that is packed full of evil monsters that seem like they are doing their best to make sure that all the ponies don't live to see another day. Well, what if it's the other way around? It seems that everything around the ponies' homeland is somewhat evil, and the ponies want to spread their good to these evil places. Well, maybe the evil ones were there first, and they weren't so aggressive until the ponies came in and started to try to force their way of life on them. Some fans speculate that the ponies are trying to gentrify everything around them so they can have everyone live like them. And all the monsters that are apparently evil are just trying to fight to survive and they never wanted to hurt anyone in the first place. Coming in at number three, we have the ultimate punishment. When you break into the MLP universe, you will find out that there is a sickness out in the wild that won't kill you, but it will make you never return to the MLP kingdom. That sickness is called Swamp Fever. If you catch Swamp Fever, you will slowly be turned into a tree that can spread this sickness. It's kind of like something pulled right out of The Last of Us. Well, some people think that the sickness used to be much worse, and that is why the ponies built the world that they live in. They wanted to have a place they could call home that wasn't filled with Swamp Fever. Once they were safe, they found a way to use Swamp Fever to keep their society in line by using it as a threat for those who break the law. They will poison them with Swamp Fever and then leave them out in the swamp so they transform and can never come back and be a burden to the rest of the ponies. Coming in at number two, we have the Parasprite Plague. Parasprites are a horrible beast that run rampant throughout the My Little Pony universe. They eat everything they come across, they can reproduce faster than Usain Bolt running the 100 meter, and on top of all this, they are super hard to get rid of. They seem like a plague pulled right out of the Bible. Well, there is one episode where the Parasprites are attacking, and the ponies manage to stop them from eating up all their food with a spell, but this only makes them start 
start eating all their homes and equipment instead. Some fans speculate that this episode took place in an alternate dimension where the ponies couldn't handle the effects of this plague and this eventually led to their death. The Parasprites continued to consume everything until there was nothing left in the pony world. And coming in at the number one spot, we have the end of days. Oh, we have made it all the way to the number one spot. And I have to say, I have learned a lot about the My Little Pony universe, and I never expected that the lore would be this deep. Even though this isn't something I'm going to be binging anytime soon, I can kind of understand how people get lost in this world, but bronies still creep me out. I haven't changed my opinion on that. Now, Tartarus is a prison where all the evildoers get locked away. Tartarus is originally pulled from Greek mythology. It's where the Titans were locked away by the gods. This brings up the question of whether or not the ponies are actually kind, because if they mirror the Greek gods in their prison, they might also mirror them in their horrible qualities. On top of this, what would happen if these monsters got out? Well, this is where this theory really shines. Some fans speculate that the end of days will come for the ponies when all of the monsters escape simultaneously and come for their revenge. It might have not been a good idea to lock all these guys away in the same place. That was probably bad foresight. All right, everyone, that has been our list. And as promised, I'm going to be doing some more pet shout outs. Remember, if you want me to shout out your pet, you can hit me up on Instagram. I pick new pets each day. So if you don't get picked one day, you can message back another day. I usually pick who has message last. So if you don't get picked, you can message again and again and again. And if it takes me a little while to get back to you, I am very sorry. I have a lot of these to do. Without taking any longer, let's shout out some pets. First up, we have three cat buddies. We got Stella, Tiger, and Kyo. I think it's Kyo. Uh, Kyo or Kilo? I'm not too sure. You guys will let me know in the comments. These dudes are the best of pals. Then we have the big old doggo who's been given the name Alien. This is the cutest ET out there. After that, we have Luke who is having a nice little cat nap. Next, we have the most adorable picture of all time of Snowball. And to close it out, we have this super cute pupper that I didn't get the name for, so you guys know that I will name him myself, and we are going to name him Lil Peanut. That's the name for this guy. Coming in at number 10 is Courage the Cowardly Dog. First of all, for those of you who don't know, the Courage the Cowardly Dog was based off a real house where many crimes occurred, which is just creepy. Now, many fans have actually theorized that the series is based on a true story of a real elderly couple and their dog. The theory goes that the old farmhouse in the middle of nowhere is a real place in New Mexico. The husband and wife living there were said to have reported many strange incidents until one day they suddenly vanished, leaving only their dog. Now, there's no denying that this story sounds eerily similar to the famed cartoon series. Now, it's also said that maybe, just maybe, nowhere is the void between this world and the next. There is a belief that the barren land that the family calls home is a void between the mortal world and the world of the supernatural. Now, this doesn't sound too far off especially when the government is keeping such a close eye on the area. Their home being right on top of the entrance and exit to the supernatural world does make a lot of sense and explains why Courage and his owners are common targets for the supernatural. Regardless, this show has just always creeped me out. Number 8. Rugrats this is the most popular cartoon theory, and it is one that I believe with my whole heart. In this fan theory, it turns out that all those adorable babies on Rugrats were nothing more than projections of Angelica's mind. We all thought Angelica was just moody because of her age and spoiled upbringing, but here it's said that her attitude is actually due to the traumatic events of the Rugrats' deaths. It seems like she's hallucinating all of this. Chucky apparently died with his mother in a crash, which is why his father is always overly worried about him, and Tommy was a stillborn, which is why Uncle Stu is constantly making toys for the son he never had. As for the DeVille twins, they were just a projection of a terminated pregnancy, so Angelica projected them as identical twins since the gender remained unknown. Now it's said that the only baby that actually exists is Dill. She can't manipulate him to do anything because he is real, and this caused her to lash out on him. She hit him so hard on the head, he suffered brain damage. Now this can be seen in the sequel to the Rugrats series, All Grown Up, as Dill always wears a hat of some kind to cover his scars. Yeah, this idea has always freaked me out. Number 6. The Powerpuff Girls The Brenda theory is a huge theory surrounding this show. It's thought that the main girl in the show, named Brenda, has Dissociative Identity Disorder, also known as DID, and that the Powerpuff Girls are just her other personalities. It's said that her older brother bullied her, which caused her DID, and this older brother 
brother would then be manifested as Mojo Jojo in the main series. Blossom represents the girl Brenda wanted to be. She wanted to be a mature and level headed girl and had an ego to boot. Bubbles represented her soft and bubbly side, and she also symbolizes the innocence and submissiveness that Brenda had possessed in reality. On a few rare occasions, however, a bit of her aggressive nature would be manifested in Bubbles, and as a result, Bubbles is often shown as being rather feisty in the main series. Buttercup is then her aggressive side. Buttercup was created from Brenda's thoughts of retaliating against her older brother, and Buttercup ultimately represents her dissatisfaction with her life. However, despite Buttercup representing her violent side, she is still shown as having hidden depths to her character. Now, these depths, however, are mostly reserved for the Bubbles persona. Number five. Bob's Burgers. It's said that Bob is the only living member of his family, and the reason the other characters are present is because Bob is having a psychotic break. As seen in season one, episode one, the restaurant is reopening for the fourth time, following a series of tragic accidents, which are seen briefly in the opening of every episode. With each accident, one of his dies, however Bob loses it beforehand with Linda's death. After Linda died, Bob opens the restaurant and decides to have it near the funeral home because he can't let her go. This lack of acceptance leads to him hallucinating Linda around the restaurant. Furthermore, Mort, the mortician, frequents the restaurant because he is aware of Bob's delusions and wants to check in on him. Bob then further loses a grasp on reality with the loss of his kids and he descends into madness. Number 4. Scooby Doo There is a theory saying that since the first Scooby Doo cartoon started in the late 60s, it was set during the Vietnam War. Now, Because the army was drafting teens at the time, the gang was forced to run away from home to relocate to Canada to avoid being drafted and going to war, which explains why in every episode they're always driving in their van with no clear destination. Shaggy is your typical hippie with a case of the munchies, and being against war, he decided to take his dog Scooby on a road trip in protest. Fred Jones is a military school dropout whose draft number was up, making him AWOL. Daphne is Fred's high school crush who can't bear the thought of Fred leaving and possibly dying in the war, so she joins the gang to be with Fred. And Velma is an anti-war activist who decides to join the gang on the road trip. And honestly, this makes sense to me. Number 3. Spongebob Squarepants Nickelodeon's official synopsis for the show states that Bikini Bottom in the town of Spongebob Squarepants is actually part of real life Bikini Atoll, specifically right underneath it. Why does this matter? Well, because Bikini Atoll was actually a testing site where the United States set off nuclear weapons in 1946 just to observe their effects. One bomb specifically was detonated underwater. Now, the resulting explosion was photographed, and every explosion that happens on the show, which happens in basically every other episode, is the exact replica of the photographed explosion. Now, this would explain why these sea creatures have come to to life and why we see a walking sea sponge interact with an entire town of wacky undersea creatures. Number 2. Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote The classic cartoon Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote consists almost exclusively of Wile E. Coyote chasing Roadrunner through a deserted landscape over and over and over again. Now The theory is that it's less likely that these two are alone in the desert playing a game of chase, and more likely that Wile E. Coyote is in his own personal hell. Considering how many times Wile E. Coyote gets blown up, or that massive ACME anvil falls on him, and how many times he keeps coming back. One Reddit thread took it even deeper, comparing the cartoon to old Greek and Native American myths about hell. They said there are two reasonable answers to be drawn from comparative mythology. The more obvious was that he was some form of glutton, and that this torment is meant as cosmic irony. This helps explain his frame, as well as his obsessive fixation on this one source of food. The more interesting explanation comes from another Greek myth about horrible eternal torture and a northwestern American Indian myth. Prometheus stole fire from Mount Olympus and gave it to a mortal man, and in return the gods chained him to a mountain and he had an eagle rip out his liver every day, only to have it magically restored in order to be ripped out again. In Karuk Native American mythology, it was a coyote who stole fire from the mountain top. Mash these two myths together and you get Wally Coyote stole fire from the gods and is therefore eternally tormented by a bird, aka Roadrunner, on a mountainside. Yeah, that is 
dark. <laughs> and coming at number one is Pokemon. Pokemon has been on television for over two decades now, and Ash Ketchum is still 10 years old in the latest iteration of the series. Now, characters not aging is a common thing in most cartoons, but in the case of Pokemon, where Ash has experienced several years of adventures and mentions those events, it's a little weird he hasn't aged today. Now, the reason behind this may be Ash slipping into a coma towards the start of the series. In this theory, Ash Ketchum fell comatose after his bike accident in episode 1, and everything after that is a dream. The people he meets are a manifestation of his inner psyche, and the adventures are trials he must overcome to escape his own mind and return to the real world. Now, This theory does make sense, as it also explains how Ash is constantly discovering new Pokemon that presumably would have been around since the start of his journey. Mm -hmm.